Hello everyone, my name is Bernadette Smith. I'm CEO of Equality Institute and I'm joined here today with Patty Flynn. Patty Flynn, you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Patty Flynn. I'm a senior DEI strategy consultant with the Equality Institute and I'm super excited to talk about the five things for this week. Cool. Well, for those of you who are joining for the first time, this is five things in 15 minutes. And in 15 minutes, Patty and I are going to talk about five inspirational news stories that I've recently read that somehow relate to diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, or perhaps corporate social responsibility. But they're all stories that I consider to be good news. And those stories go out to the world every Saturday morning in the Five Things newsletter, which you can subscribe to at theequalityinstitute.com slash join. So if you want some good news every Saturday morning, that is how you can get some. And then on Mondays, we, we go on LinkedIn for a video recap of all of those five things. So Patty, today happens to be Americans with Disabilities Act Day. Did you know that? I didn't know that. I did know from reading the newsletter that it's Disability Awareness Month. Yeah, it's Disability. I did not know either. Pride Month. Oh, Pride Month. Disability yeah. Pride Month. Okay. Yeah. So I um I actually wasn't aware of that either. And honestly, I don't know a lot about disability inclusion or disability pride in general. So you know, I talk about inclusion a lot, but that's not an area of my expertise. Um, hi, Jeremy. Hi, Trice. Um, feel free to, anyway, anyone, by the way, who's watching, feel free to type questions in the chat or comment in the chat at any point. Anyway, so I don't happen to know a lot about disability inclusion, but one thing I did learn is that Kellogg cereal boxes will soon be the first technology or first product in the world, packaging in the world, to use a technology where people who are blind or visually impaired can have the side of the cereal box read to them aloud via their smartphone when they're grocery shopping or I guess at home. Pretty awesome, it's, right? It's pretty amazing, yeah. And you know, like the focus of that article is really um, on store shelves, but also the possibility of being able to know what is in your cabinet at home um, is also fantastic for um, visually impaired people. It, it's, it's a, I, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the technology myself other than reading this article, but it seems like a really, really big step um, to helping folks be able to navigate life a little bit more easily. Yeah, exactly. So this technology has been uh, primarily used in transit systems to help people who are visually impaired navigate. And this is the first time it's actually being used on packaging and it, Kellogg started with a pilot in the UK that must have been a pretty big success. There are two, two million um, blind or visually impaired people there. So it was a success and they're all launching it worldwide. Pretty, I, I just think it's fantastic. I've never, I mean, these are the types of things that I personally don't have to think about. I don't have to worry about. Yeah, and I, you know, like you were saying, I don't have a, a tremendous amount of I don't have lived experience um, being in, in a disability community, um, although I do have some people that I'm uh, friends with who have been um, doing work with those communities in sport, um, Dare to Try in Chicago, and then um, a friend of mine just was a uh, visually impaired guide for someone in a uh, championship triathlon race uh, this last weekend. Um, and so I've been able to see some of that in action, and it's really it's really amazing um, uh, to see that uh, level of support for, for folks in that community. And, and this is just an extent, you know, this is another extension of like, why not make, why we don't have to make things harder for folks. Um, and it's kind of like the, you know, at some level, the, um, the descriptions behind um, social posts, that there's a, a picture in a social post putting in that alt text so that visually impaired people know what is in the picture. Um, this yeah. is the packaging version of it. Absolutely. And Trice actually shared that in the UK, a lot of the medicines and vitamin packages are, are also in Braille, which is pretty great. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. I mean, again, these are the things that I don't have to think about, but inclusion, it means, it means so much. All right. So moving on, um, another good story that I found is that Illinois, which is where we live, Patty, 
first, obviously, <laughs> you know where you live. It's the I first do. state in the country um, to require, beginning in 2022, teaching of the Asian American history in public schools. Now, I think this is pretty impressive. About, I think, eight or nine states now re require teaching of LGBTQ history in public schools. This is the first state to require teaching of Asian American history. Yeah. Um, and again, when people's histories are erased, um, it makes it harder for us to understand where we come from. It makes it harder for that for folks in those communities to understand their own history. Um, history has largely been written, at least in this country, by white men in the past. And so the history has reflected that. And um, it's going to be uh, great to kind of piggyback on the LGBTQ history project that um, has been going on uh, over the last couple of years to get that introduced into classes. And it's really important for people to um, be able to see themselves in history um, and not have their stories erased, frankly speaking. Um, so very happy to see this, this kind of um, uh, movement uh, for folks that, um, you know, to, to eliminate these stereotypes as the, um, as the article says, it, it, it just, puts this out in the daylight. Yeah, I agree. I think it's important that we, the curriculum and the the stories are not just stories of, of struggle, but stories of triumph, stories of joy, stories that illustrate possibility models. And you're right, these are stories that have been primarily erased. And I think it's just important that young people get a well-rounded education um, and all these voices do matter. So. Happy to be uh, an Illinoisan. All right. Um, next up, Demi Lovato, who is uh, who uses they them pronouns, was uh, she gave a shout out to? Oh, they gave it. Jeez, they gave a shout out to Lizzo recently because Lizzo corrected a paparazzi who misgendered Demi Lovato, and Lizzo simply said their team. Demi goes by they. And just did a really nice kind of effortless off the cuff kind of correction slash allyship. And I want to mention, I mentioned this because it doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be a big conversation. It can just be a simple correction. And Lizzo modeled that beautifully, how to be a great ally to someone who uses they, them pronouns. Yeah, I watched the video and the ease at, with, at which Lizzo was able to make that correction without even, you know, without even a second thought. Um, some paparazzi were yelling, misgendering Demi. Um, she didn't make, Lizzo didn't make a big deal out of it. Just made the correction and kept moving. And um, powerful stuff. That's, you know, Demi wasn't with Lizzo at that point. So that's the biggest type of allyship is when someone's not around, you know, they have your back, that is, that is allyship. That is standing up for someone when they're, when they're not there, when they're not reminding you of their existence and, and the need for this allyship. Um, so it was really, really good to see that video. I don't normally follow too much pop culture, but, um, you know, when it does apply to inclusion and the things that I work on, I definitely keep a tune it attuned to it and um, was it was great to see. Yeah, what I like, I mean, there's so much goodness there, but I think that it's, it's a powerful model because a lot of well-meaning well folks want to be allies, but they don't know what that looks like. They don't know what that sounds like. They don't know what the words are. Well, Lizzo just showed it. Lizzo modeled it. And, uh, and so hopefully other folks will follow suit and they'll see that and be inspired. All right, next up, Best Buy committed to spending $1.2 billion with diverse suppliers, including um, on marketing. So not just products, but marketing by uh, 2025. So doing that by supplier diversity initiatives and, uh, and marketing spend. Pretty great by Best Buy. Right, um, you know, it, it is a longer term plan. So it's not like we're, they're, 
they're going to be able to flip a switch. But it's also, you know, within three and a half years, they're committing to this level of spend. And so that's a, that's a big deal for, you know, corporations can sometimes be like the evergreen tanker and get stuck in a canal and not be able to change things very quickly. And um, for them to be able to make a pivot like this um, to change some of their purchasing um, and to not only for short uh, shelf space, but also for marketing and, um, and any other, you know, like advertising cast members, um, you know, those kinds of things that that's a, that's a big deal. And, and, you know, I, I've said it before when I've been on this and I say it when I'm not on this, that you know, represent representation is crucial. Um, and, you know, even though it's a corporate representation at some level in a commercial, you know, we cringe a little bit, but also it's important to see ourselves in these commercials and in these, um, in, in, in these places. So, um, you know, there, it's, it's more than just buying from suppliers for their, for their store to resell. It's, it's, it's a little bit more in depth than that. And I think that that's what makes this a little bit more special. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's, it's nice that it's, it's a more comprehensive approach. It's a more 360 approach. And I appreciate that. I mean, these are the types of initiatives that are equity. These are that, that create more equity that start to level the playing field that start to make up for centuries of structural racism. And what I like about that is because when we change the systems in this way, we make these kinds of commitments, a Best Buy is going to be held accountable. So people are going to be checking in on them. The media is going to be checking in on them. The employees are going to be checking in on them. And B, these are the types of things that can reduce the racial wealth gap. So it's it goes a long way. Um, it really is about generating more wealth, and and I love that. Okay, I, I was gonna I was gonna talk about that as you're leading into the next one. I mean, it it it's very similar, but I'll let you introduce it since I since sure. I cut you off. Yeah, no problem. Next up is Nordstrom, which signed a 10 year commitment to the 15 percent pledge. The 15 percent pledge is a commitment to dedicate 15 percent of shelf space to black founders. So there are a bunch of retailers who are uh, signed on to the 15 percent pledge. Nordstrom is the first to sign a 10 year commitment. Um, and also, since the 15 percent pledge is about a year old, they did some reporting and have announced that about $15 billion in revenue was great, was generated for black founders in the one year that the 15% pledge has been uh, open. Right. 15 I mean, billion. You know, like structural racism has been around a long time. Um, we're not gonna expect to change it overnight, but it's nice to see these kinds of changes happening and having effect. Um, you know, the commitment by Best Buy was to, to start making changes and, and implement them fully by uh, in a couple of years. This is a pledge to do this for, for 10 years. And so they're the first company to sign on to do that. There are several other retailers that are doing this, but haven't made this long-term commitment to um, changing the, the, the face of what they have available to their customers. And, um, you know, there's one way to inject money into a community. It's it's by lifting up the entrepreneurs in those communities, and, and you know I'm hoping that that money will stay in those communities, and, and that um, that will help generate inter intergenerational wealth development and, and building. I mean, it, it's the it's how this changes. I absolutely agree, and and that's what it's all about. It's about generating more wealth. It, and which has a huge ripple effect in, in so many ways. And um, so a big props to the 15% pledge and all of the retailers that they've been able to get on board. It's not 15% now. They're not, they're not, they're not all at that level yet, but it's some, it's something that they are getting to with the support of the nonprofit, the 15% pledge, which you can see the 15th uh, October presented that link in the chat there. Um, Okay, so that's five things in 15 minutes. Thank you all for joining. Uh, Patty, I'm gonna talk to you about something else and anyone who wants to stick stick around, watch, uh, <laughs> stay with us for another minute or two. Um, so I posted this story on LinkedIn this morning, but late last night or last night, I received 
comments, feedback on my book. So my book had been is in the hands or was in the hands of someone doing the index. So the, the part of the back of the book that tells you what page you can find, you know, the word diversity on that kind of thing. So I hired someone to do the index and that's all they they were hired to do because it's already been through a full edit, multiple full edits. And this person sent me nine pages of single typed, single spaced notes on the book um, and really notes that sort of go against everything the book stands for, um, including what I what I know about anti-racism, what I know about the Civil Rights Act, what I know about meritocracy, um, the basics of LGBTQ inclusion. Like there are, um, it was it was really hard to read, but it was it was good for me to get that feedback because I'm not going to use it first of all, but because I um, it's good for me to remember that I not everyone agrees with me, not everyone thinks the way I do, and I do live in a bubble, so I appreciate that. Jeremy is absolutely accurate. Um, it uh, was the, this is like the most intense level of mansplaining I've ever heard of. Nine pages, single spaced mansplaining. I mean, I would, I, I'm glad that you had the option to read it or not read it. I mean, if you were trapped in a room with someone giving you nine pages worth of mansplaining, I, you know, my head might explode. Um, it, it's like, you should just, put it out as an additional chapter and call, entitle it, well, actually. It, it's just unreal, unreal, the level of, um, you know, I, I, I can't, I don't have words. And, and, you know, like, it's not even, at, at, at some level, yeah, I understand that you're like, well, this, you know, not everybody agrees with me. This is, I think, a different level of that. I think this is, you know, like, people can not necessarily agree with everything that you have to say and everything that you present in the book and and not do something like this. This is this is beyond disagreement. This is some yeah. sort of active pushback that means that we're on the right track as far as I'm concerned. You know, like this kind of movement, this kind of work is so important to be done because there are folks out there that are actively working against it. But it means that we're in that like you know, there's the five stages of essentially denial, you know, like <laughs> denial is one of them and like active pushback and then and then we win. So <laughs> like, we're, we're making enough of, a, of a, a change and you are in particular by writing this all down and, and putting this on paper that it's galvanized a little bit of resistance. And that is important to know where we're at on, you know, as, as an inclusion experts, where we're at on this uh, I don't want to say journey because it's not. We don't know what the ending is. It's an adventure. Yeah, it certainly is an inclusion adventure. You know, I um, I prefer to to think that it's not necessarily because he that it's not necessarily mansplaining. You know, I prefer <laughs> I prefer to think that you know it's these are comments, opinions that could have come from anyone and. Um, and I'm choosing to ignore them, but I'm choosing to use them as fuel because I know that this work is important and I believe in my words and I believe in the message of the book. And you know what? And hopefully there will, there will be lots of people who get psyched about it and, and start their own inclusion adventure, as you said. Um, but you know, haters gonna hate. And but I, he wasn't hating. He was trying to be helpful. That's the thing. Yes, and I guess that's why uh, it was characterized as mansplaining because he was trying to be helpful. Um, and he was helpful because now I have more fuel. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it stinks. I you know like the whole the whole concept behind the five things is the is the positive fuel. It's the joy. It's the yeah. it's the things that are going right. Um, occasionally we need to be fortified by a little bit of pushback, a little bit of resistance, even if it's unknowing resistance or ignorance that um, it looks like resistance, like this is probably the, the case of ignorance um, speaking out loud. And, um, and unfortunately that is a valid source of fuel for, for the, the engine of inclusion to move forward. Um, 
but like I said, you know, these kind of attitudes and pushback are, are indicative of being on the right course. If, yeah. if there was nobody making statements like this, um, regardless of intent, um, you would have to think, well, maybe am I doing something wrong? Am I not hitting the right tones? Am I not, am I not going the right direction with this? And, and so I would, I would well, definitely take this as like, you're on the right track. <laughs> well, I guess since in his nine pages of single space notes for me, um, since he called me racist, basically racist against white people m many dozens of times, um, I guess that is validation that I pushed the envelope a bit, you know, and I'm honestly not that much of an envelope pusher, but I guess I, I guess I did a bit in the yeah. book and I, that's good. It's good. I, There's no such thing as racist against white people. I'm sorry. <laughs> there isn't, there isn't. Um, <laughs> sorry, and, sorry for those that might think that. Thank you all for sticking around while Patty and I process this <laughs> um, this experience. And uh, I do always try to stay positive. I always try to look for the positive intent. Thank you, Denise, and um, try to find the good vibe. So please join us next week for Five Things in 15 Minutes. Please subscribe to Five Things if you want some good vibes every Saturday morning. And thank you so much for joining me today and to everyone who is watching. Have a great rest of your week. Take care.